in this video, we're discussing an approximation technique called the range rule of thumb. It's designed to approximate the population standard deviation, which is often not known when you're looking at a journal article or something like that. So maybe you read a news report or a journal article, and maybe they're talking about the average for a data set, but they don't tell you what the standard deviation is. That's pretty common even today. Um, they should know better. They should report the standard deviation, knowing that some of the readers are sophisticated enough to use it, but they don't always do that. And because they don't do that, you're kind of left a lot of times where you can't perform your own statistical calculations on it because you don't know the standard deviation. Or maybe you're just curious for your own knowledge, you know, what is the vari variation in the data set, you know, um, what's typical variation like, and if you don't have a standard deviation measurement, there's no way to do that. So. What we want to do here is to talk about a method that logically lets you approximate the standard deviation without actually having to collect data. So that's kind of nice. Um, it's not as good as collecting data. If you have data, you want to approximate the standard deviation using S. We know that, right? But if you don't have data, you're sort of stuck doing it the way I'm about to show you. So, you know, of course you could go collect data. That's always a possibility. But assuming that you're not going to be able to do that quickly or efficiently, let's talk about a way you can approximate this value. So I've drawn a bell curve on the board, and we know that all data, not all data is bell-shaped in nature, but we're just going to use this for a rule of thumb here at the moment. Um, and if I drew a bell curve and I label three standard deviations above the mean, three standard deviations below the mean, that span captures 99.7% of all the data on the bell curve. That's according to the empirical rule, right? That's a property of the bell curve. Now, since this is almost all the data here, I could kind of call that the maximum, right? I mean, think about it. If this is almost all the data, that's sort of a maximum value, right? Of course, there are values that are bigger, so it's not really a maximum, but it's approximately a maximum, right? And this is approximately a minimum, isn't it? And if that's the case, then couldn't we say that the range is approximately this number minus this number? Because max minus min is the range by definition. So maybe I could do the mean plus three standard deviations minus parentheses the mean minus three standard deviations. And if I did that, what would I get? I'd get the mean plus three standard deviations minus the mean plus three standard deviations, right? Because negative times negative makes a positive. And then what you would say is that, hey, the means cancel out because one is negative, one is positive. And you get six sigma left over. Three sigma and three sigma make six sigma. So you have this relationship that says, hey, the range is approximately six sigma. Now what would happen if I divided both sides by six? Well, the six here would go away and we'd have this rule of thumb that sigma, the population standard deviation, is approximately the range over six, right? And that would be it. And that's kind of where we derive this rule from. Now, you may have seen it as the range over 4, or you may have seen both given. What I'll say about that is that the range over 6 um, is probably safer, in my opinion, because if things aren't bell-shaped, you know that a span of three standard deviations above and below, according to Chebyshev's theorem, must contain at least 89.9% of the data, so virtually 90% of the data. It must contain at least 90% of the data, no less than that. So you know that a span of six standard deviations, regardless of how your phenomena is distributed, if it's bell-shaped, it'll capture 99.7%. But that span under any curve captures no less than about 90% of the data. So that's still a pretty good span. So I like the range over six. Other people like the range over four. If you know it's sort of bell-shaped in nature, then you can use that. Um, some people use both and they create like an interval and they say their standard deviation should be within those two values, whatever you like. But for me, I'm going to use uh, the range over six as my approximation method. Now, based on that, how do I put it to work? Well, there's two ways you can do this. You can, if you're working with actual data as a student in a classroom and you're doing a test and you're calculating the standard deviation from a sample of data, sometimes you'll make a small calculation error, like you forget to pick the square root or you do something else silly in the calculation and the result isn't good. And you have no way to check that except for redoing it and hoping you don't make the same mistake twice. But you can use this as an approximation to what the real answer should be, and if it's close to the answer you calculated, maybe you did it right. If it's very different, you probably did it wrong. So how do you do that? Well, you just take, in the sample they gave you to work in the problem, just take the largest number and the smallest number, subtract them, and divide by either four or six, and that number should be around where the population standard deviation is, and it should be around where your sample standard deviation is. 
if your number is very different from that, then you probably made a mistake, right? So for example, if your you know if your number is close to a hundred and this number comes out close to say ten, it's probably that you forgot to take the square root in your answer, and that's why your number's too high. So you could look for that specific mistake. So that's one application of it. Um, I think a more useful application though is to actually try to estimate standard deviations when you don't know them and you have no way to collect data quickly to figure out what they are. So in that case, you might use this approximation technique. So let's demonstrate that once and see how it works out. Um, let's take female heights, for example. All I have to do to use this approximation technique is to get a range. I need a very tall person, for example, if I'm looking at female heights, and a very short person if I'm looking for female heights. So let's try to think of a height that's pretty tall for women. Something that's not ridiculously tall. We don't want the tallest woman ever on earth, right? That's not what this number is. It's just a very tall woman. A woman is so tall, after you get past her, you're starting to get into outlier territory, right? The person is, you know, starting to become ridiculously tall. So, you know, I think for women, you know, six foot is pretty tall for a woman. There aren't very many women who are six feet tall. That's got to be a very small percentage of the population. So maybe I'm going to let my maximum just be six foot for women. So I'm going to say let the max here in this case, for my made up example, be 72 inches. That's 6 times 12, 72 inches. And then for the minimum, I'll pick a height that's pretty short. You know, you might choose, say, 5 foot. Um, I personally have a lot of experience meeting 5 foot tall women, so I'm not going to say 5 foot is so rare. I'm going to go with something shorter than that. So maybe like, you know, I don't know, 4 foot 9, 4 foot 10, something like that, right? Let's take, for example, if we did uh, 4 foot 9. 4 foot 9 is 48 inches plus another 9 inches, so that's 57 inches if I do that. And that's 57 for the short end, right? So let me know. So this is a span of 6 foot to 4 foot 9. I would say that that's probably pretty close to 99.7% of women. Maybe it's not quite that much, but it's, it's got to be pretty close to it. I'm going to subtract them. And that's going to give me a range. So I'm going to say my range, right, is approximately this. Well, what is the difference between 72 and 57? Well, if we work that out, I believe that's 15, right? Right. If you add 15 to 57, we see 67 plus another 5. That's 72. So I think that's right. My range is approximately 15, then, right? So actually, my range is exactly 15, but we're saying that. Uh, the range is approximately 15 because these numbers are made up, right? They're not really maximum and minimums, but they're pretty close to it. All right, now if that's my range, then according to this rule, if I divide that range by 6, I should get approximately the standard deviation. So in other words, if I do 15 over 6, that should be approximately the standard deviation for female heights. What is 15 over 6? Well, 6 will go in there evenly twice, right? It'll definitely go in there twice because that'll go into 12 twice. That'll give you 3 left over. 3 6 is a half, so that's 0.5. So you get approximately 2.5. And, and so that is my approximation for the population standard deviation for female heights, 2.5. Now, I don't think anyone actually knows this number, right? You don't, they don't know it exactly because, of course, you know, it's a population that's too big to sample every woman in. but. You know, I've seen studies where they look at female heights, and I gotta tell you, 2.5 has been often reported as the standard deviation in the study. I've also seen numbers like 2.6, 2.4, 2.3, so I've seen different numbers depending on uh, where the data is coming from, but 2.5 is pretty darn close to the actual value if it isn't the actual value itself. And we did that strictly by a thought experiment, right? We didn't go collect any data. Now you may say, well, you planned that out, you know, you figured out which number would give you the right thing. I, I swear I didn't do that. I just picked a number that is actually really tall and one that I consider to be pretty short, and voila, 2.5 turns out to be the result. If I had picked something taller than six foot or even something shorter than this or something maybe not as short, you know, or maybe something not as tall, the number would obviously maybe not be as good, but I bet it would be still pretty close. It would be in the ballpark of the results that you expect to find. And so that's why I think this approximation technique is so powerful. I've used it at times when I was creating a homework problem for students and I couldn't find the standard deviation, but I needed it. So I used it as an approximation to guess what it would be. And then later on, after looking at further research, I was able to finally find the standard deviation that I was looking for. And I would find sometimes I was very close, if not right on to the number. So this method is really actually pretty good. If you have to use it in a pinch, it doesn't, do, doesn't produce bad results. It's pretty good. And also it helps you remember the sort of relationship of three standard deviations capturing a large amount of the data. And finally, before we leave the video, I just want to say that um, don't forget range over four is sometimes used as the range rule of thumb as well. And so 
Uh, if you see the range over four, it's the equivalent idea. It's just that they're only using the mean plus two standard deviations and the mean minus two standard deviations as their max and their min. That's all they've done. That's done. 